Hello everyone and welcome to a Realism Overhaul Sandbox recreation of Spatial Mission STS-41B. Now we are currently 17 minutes late for the launch. It's supposed to be February 3rd, 1984 at 1 o'clock p.m. UTC. So let's get started and I'll talk about the mission along the way. Also, why I'm doing it. So we have ignition. The launch pad is from Real KSC using Kerbal Constructs. And we're off. So, the reason I'm doing this mission is because I actually want to do STS-51A, which is, I think, my favorite space shuttle mission. That's the one I most want to do. Uh, but, in order to do that one, you have to do this one first. And that's because during this mission, they strand two satellites in orbit around the Earth. And STS-51A launches two satellites, but also brings the two satellites that were stranded by this mission back. Now, that downside to this mission isn't the only reason to pay attention to this one. Uh, it's notable for many other things, including the first use of the MMU, the Man Maneuvering Unit, which was the way that an uh, astronaut could move around without a tether. The first untethered spacewalk by Bruce McCandless, with all those famous photos, was this mission. And it was also the first mission that adopted the horrible numbering system. After STS-9, the ninth space shuttle mission, uh, they decided to change the numbering system. Uh, and the system was that the first number, the four in this case, was the year, in this case 1984. Um, the second number, one, indicated the launch site, one for Cape Canaveral and two for Vandenberg. There was never a launch from Vandenberg, so you'll never see a mission with two in that slot. And then B was the order of the mission, uh, A for the first one of the year, B for the second, C for the third, except it all went screwy anyway. Um, so uh, it, it was all messed up. The spatial missions are never in order. They were always, some were canceled, like STS-10. So they changed the numbering system after STS-9. STS-10 got canceled. This is actually supposed to be STS-11. And of course there, there wasn't uh, STS-41A in that case. Well, yeah. So it was very confusing. And after the Challenger disaster, they went back to just using normal numbers. So, yeah. but. This is the start of that numbering system. The reason for changing the numbering system in the first place probably had to do with uh, administra uh, not the administrator of NASA, but somebody in management at NASA being afraid of the number 13 and also association with Apollo 13. And so they decided to skip the number 13 and they came up with this clever system in order to avoid it. But yeah. So the crew for this mission obviously were not Barnard Kerman, Berlin Kerman, Josen Kerman, or anything like that. It was Vance Brand on his third space flight, Hoot Gibson on his first, Bruce McCandless on his first, Robert Stewart on his first space flight, and Roland McNair on his first space flight. So except for Vance Brand, they were all rookies. Now Bruce McCandless was a long-suffering rookie. He joined NASA as an astronaut in 1966, and so waited almost 18 years for his first space flight. And I don't know if that's a record or not, but it might be. Uh, somebody will have to tell me if some astronaut managed to wait longer than that. But on the bright side, he did get to have the first untethered spacewalk, and that was certainly something to remember. And uh, actually on his uh, second mission, uh, he only did two, two missions. His second mission was the Hubble deployment. So that was also a very special mission. And uh, other than that, uh, Raul McNair unfortunately died on uh, the Challenger disaster. This space shuttle is Challenger. Um, so, yeah, but obviously this is, you know, on, in the brighter days. And STS-51A, which I will uh, do later, was also in the brighter days of the space shuttle program. And we'll be talking a lot about how the space shuttle program changed after Challenger in the video on STS-51A. Though I still have some technical issues to work out about how exactly I want to execute that mission because it is complicated. The payload for this mission currently in the bay is a little bit lighter than it ought to be and that's because the only way that I could simulate the failure that occurs 
is by reducing the amount of solid fuel, HTPB, in the perigee kick motors for the satellites. And basically what the satellites did was they burned for a bit and then stopped uh, for reasons un I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody else knows. But it was unclear to me why they would do something like that. Normally, normally SRBs don't randomly stop in the middle of nowhere. Um, a little inaccuracy, I put uh, separatrons on the external tank uh, in order to clear it from the space shuttle so that the script can, can continue. Otherwise, it's a little bit difficult for the script to do an accurate avoidance maneuver. Anyway, so yes, I don't know exactly why the little SRBs, the kick motors, stopped after about 20 seconds, but they did, and that was the problem. And then the ground crews had to use the RCS on the satellites in order to bring them back down to an orbit that the shuttle could retrieve them in STS-51A. It was very odd that both of the satellites launched on this mission had that same problem. And so that was peculiar. And, well, just goes to show, uh, even SRBs are only as good as you manufacture them. So, in this case, they had a problem. We are also missing one uh, scientific payload in the bay that I did not model. Uh, as far as the payloads that are in the bay, I did model them except for the SRBs. Those I used uh, pre-made pre SRBs from a different mod. So, we are just uh, coasting up to Apoapsis, and during this phase, I just do allow the shuttle to roll while KOS is time warping. KOS has been controlling the launch so far, and that's because it's a lot smoother than me trying to manually handle the shuttle during the rolls. Okay, we've come out of time warp, and the shuttle is turning to make its OMS burn, the orbital maneuvering system engines. Unfortunately, they're not very powerful engines on the tail here, uh, this one and that one but they get the job done. And they were very reliable engines, so reliable that they are the engines that have been selected for the Orion service module, the AJ-10 190s. Our apoapsis has ended up a bit high compared to where we need to be. We need to be about 307 by 317 is the desired orbit, and the inclination is supposed to be 28.5. Uh, the script has ended, and I'm going to continue this burn, actually. So we're at basically the right inclination. The satellites were deployed eight hours after launch, so we'll do that. But we'll probably not wait in orbit for the full time that they did. And that's because our EVA is going to be much simpler. Uh, the mission duration was nearly eight days. And uh, the first EVA with the... MMU, Man Maneuvering Unit, was on day four, and then the second EVA on day six. Those were each six hour EVAs, so we are not going to be doing that. We will expedite that part of the mission and bring it back probably in just one day. This was uh, unique in another way, this mission, and that's that it was the first mission to land back at its launch site at Cape Canaveral, which simplifies things for me tremendously, uh, especially since Realism Overhaul doesn't have Edwards Air Force Base normally. Okay, so our periapsis is 307, we need our apoapsis to be 317, and then we're all good. So I'm just gonna time, oh, well, let's open up the bay. And I'll show you what's going on in there. And got to start the fuel cell. The shading on this part is a little bit weird, and I don't know why. It looks fine in, at nighttime, but it has to do with my post-processing shader. You'll note that I have KS3P active, and that post-processing does not treat this, these parts well. They look fine in like Blender or Unity, but anyway, these are PAMD cradles, and I'll just open it up so you can see the satellite. They're like Pac-Man devices. You'll see them in a lot of uh, shuttle photos. And they basically carry satellites that would have been about the right size for a Delta launch or a Delta II launch. Basically, uh, the shuttle could carry four of the Delta payloads on its own. And the two satellites in question, 
was Westar 6 and Palapa B2. Westar 6 was for Western Union and Palapa B2 for Indonesia. And this was a phase in the shuttle campaign, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, the career of the space shuttles that they were allowed to carry commercial payloads. After Challenger, they weren't allowed to. And of course, carrying commercial payloads helped pay for the shuttle missions quite a lot. These two uh, satellites had an estimated value of $250 million, and I believe that's in, uh, in those that era dollars, so much more now. A typical, these are both geosynchronous satellites. Typical geosynchronous satellites could be $200, $300 million or more. So we're talking about half a billion dollars worth of payload there. So, you know, charging for that. And of course, there were other scientific payloads that the shuttle carried, and it was also testing its own MMUs and all that business. And yeah, so if you had a high flight frequency, and we'll talk about that more in SES 51A, then you could actually make the shuttle work for you. But after Challenger, they stopped carrying commercial payloads and that of course hurt the entire system. So I'm gonna time warp for eight hours and then we will try to deploy these satellites. Okay, I don't know how exactly we need to be on the eight hour mark, but the important thing is to get it ahead of the equator. That's very important because these are geosynchronous satellites, so you have to do their burn at the equator. So we are going to go radio plus and force a 180 roll. Oh, another uh, part that I did not make that's involved in the deployment of these satellites is the rotatron that is going to spin them up before they head out. I forget which one is which. They they were basically identical satellites. They're very similar in construction, probably the same basic um, bus, if you will. So, and they look identical, which is good for the retrieval because they were both retrieved in exactly the same way. So, yeah, uh, they're, they are looking the same. I just called them TubSats, to be honest. Tub style satellite. And we'll talk more about that when they are released. I'll show you how they work. But, yep, yeah, let's see which one is going to. That's that one. Now we're going to wait until the shuttle stops compensating for rotation because of angular mom momentum and everything. And it seems to have settled down and off it goes. So it's spin stabilized for this motor. And then once it's clear of the shuttle a good ways, they probably did a minor avoidance maneuver. Okay, I'm, I'm sick of that sound, so hold on. Let me just stop that. Okay, so there is, uh, this is the perigee kick motor, and then there is an apogee kick motor there once it gets up to where it needs to be uh, to circularize its orbit. But right now the staging is wrong. We want this one. And I'll activate the RCS as well. I don't know exactly where the RCS ports were supposed to be, but I put them at the top here because that was most useful for me. And, oh, I forgot to bring down the, see, I was too busy talking. I was supposed to bring down the apoapsis. It's a little bit high this time. Well, more of a challenge for the next mission. Okay, so let's see if I put packed too much of the HTPB in. In which case, this has got to be more difficult. I think we're sufficiently clear from the shuttle. They It was close enough to the shuttle that they were able to see the motor go out too early. So they were actually uh, recording it on video. So, go. Uh, it said something like it lasted like 20 seconds. I think this is a reasonable amount. Now, can the hydrazine be used to bring it back down? It's going to take a while. I'll wait until the next orbit to get the get the other satellite out, I think. Okay, I'm not quite there yet, but it's going to take a little bit more doing because I've already gotten to 411 kilometers, so it'll probably take another orbit to actually bring that apoapsis down to where it needs to be. But I just wanted to show you how these work because I didn't even realize satellites did this sort of thing 
until I took a look at this uh, mission. And the thing that it does is it extends its solar panel like this. Almost, almost like a telescope sort of thing. Of course, it uses its Apogee kick motor first, but uh, yeah, and then its antenna goes like that, and then it uh, sticks up that. Yep, that's what this type of satellite looks like. And yep, this was apparently a sort of standard sort of thing at that time. Anyway, let's get the other satellite out and deployed. So again, it has to turn this way to eject the satellite prograde after all the satellite has been stabilized initially. Of course, it does have its own thrusters, otherwise it wouldn't be able to stay in geosynchronous orbit properly. So we're going to start spinning it. Wait for the shuttle to stabilize itself. And off it goes. Okay, this time I am going to wait until the equator. The last one I didn't really, I wasn't very patient. This time I'll try to be patient. This is where persistent rotation is helpful. Unfortunately, even with the spin stabilization, I guess I should spin it up a little bit faster or something. Anyway, ignition. They probably did attempt to correct inclination a little bit at the equator. Of course, that's not the good thing to do here, but it depends on how much fuel the SRB actually had compared to the mass of the satellite. But the satellite and the Apogee kick motor was probably specifically sized to make sure that the Star 48B in this case didn't have a whole lot of extra fuel to waste. Anyway, we've brought it up and uh, you had seen I, I separated off the SRB because when they retrieve it, that, that was a factor of attachment. When they retrieve it, it didn't have the perigee kick motor. They, it only had the apogee kick motor. The way they retrieve it in STS-51A is they actually have to stick a sort of harpoon into the SRB, uh, the apogee kick motor. So that's a bit fancy. Anyway, I'm going to use the hydrazine to bring this back down to a happier orbit, and then we will bring the shuttle back down. Okay, so I have not forgotten about the EVA. We need to do that, and we'll have Josen Kerman head out and float about a bit. But first I want to bring the orbit down into a more standard orbit and also account for the fact that we've been sort of delaying ourselves by 40 seconds each time. I want to, at the end of the day, line up with Cape Canaveral properly. And that means that the easiest way to do that is make sure that you have an orbital period of an hour and a half. And so for about half a day, we've been spending it at, with an orbital period more than that, um, we can't go too much less than an hour and a half, to be honest. The ISS is at uh, one hour and 33 minutes, which is also sort of even. That means every two days you can line up. I mean, this is to make it easy. NASA can calculate it out easily. That's it. This is just because I do not have NASA resources. But anyway, so I'm going to bring us down a little bit and then we'll do the EVA. All right, we are in our lower orbit. And, of course, the EVA would have gone through many day and night cycles because it was a six-hour EVA. So we can just pop out whenever. Uh, here's Josen going out the hatch. Oh, the hatch is right there, right next to my lead weight. I should have probably moved the lead weight to somewhere else. Um, <laughs> that's awkward, but all right. So... Being so used to a Kerbal Space Program where we have these... God, the glare is really rough. Have these Kerbals that have these jetpacks all the time. It's easy to forget that this was the first time in 1984 that an untethered spacewalk became possible. And actually the MMU would be particularly helpful on the STS-51A mission. This was just a test for it, but in the STS-51A mission, it actually got a practical use when they were retrieving the satellites, because in order to harpoon the satellites, they had to have an uh, astronaut carry the harpoon with the jetpack and get it into the satellites in question. And, you know, that often, I mean, that meant that they had to 
go out there at the location that they couldn't simply go out with a tether or be carried by the canid arm. They were assisted by another astronaut on the canid arm, but it was definitely a two astronaut job minimum. I wonder if I can get back through this hatch with that lead weight there. The lead weight is there to compensate for the mass in the back. Remember, I fully fueled this shuttle. And they often carried lead weights in the forward wheel well in order to bring the center of mass forward. That's basically the situation here. Well, it looks like we can board. And in this case, it's a two ton lead weight, which is really heavy. But I've done what I can to figure out the balance of this. More tweaking may be necessary. Uh, if uh, people caught the live streams where I was trying to figure out this mission, that uh, re-entry has been a pain in the rear end. But here we go. I'm going to time warp to the appropriate time for re-entry. And uh, we're going to lift the orbit back up to an hour and a half because that's what the re-entry script is based on. And we are currently approaching the Philippines here. And I'll see you when our re-entry begins. Okay, well, we're at a one and a half hour orbit, standard. We've got a fair amount of fuel left, and I'm going to run the re-entry script now. And let's hope for the best. In this case, any waste of RCS is fine. We're actually carrying too much fuel, so I'm just going to let it go. I allowed a time from 140 kilometers to 100 kilometers or so. I'd put caps lock on for fine controls to limit how much it was wasting of the RCS, but in this case, um, wasting is fine. Okay, we have OMS engine ignition, and the script is going to bring the orbit, the periapsis down to a point that's dependent on our vessel mass. So it reads how much mass we bring down, in this case, just the cradles and the rotatrons and the couplers in the back there, and of course, the lead weight. <laughs> Okay, we've completed the retro burn, and it is a periapsis of 36 kilometers. The shuttle, I believe, went lower than that, generally speaking. That makes it easier to predict, but uh, for now I've kept it to this level. Now, my script does not do S-turns, and that's because, frankly, KOS and rolls don't mix. I've tried to actually make it roll, and it really doesn't want to roll until it gets to about 65 kilometers. It's actually told to roll a little bit in order to correct its heading and aim for the for Cape Canaveral in this case, for the landing site. But it really doesn't like to do that at higher altitudes, which makes S-turning in order to kill velocity very difficult. So it just uses pitch to correct the the trajectory um, goes from 37 to 45. The shuttle kept to 40, basically. The way the script works is it actually cuts the descent path out in chunks based on the distance to the landing site. And then it also associates that with altitudes. So it goes from 140 kilometers to 120 kilometers. It should be starting out at one distance away from the landing site to another distance away from the landing site. And if it uh, sees that it's too far away from the landing site based on that chunk, it'll uh, pitch down in order to get more lift. And if it's uh, too close, it'll pitch up. And then it's all chunked out that way. Now, of course, I'm bringing the mission down early and that's just to make it easier to phase with Cape Canaveral, make sure we're in line with it. If I wait eight days, I really do have to actually calculate it out and make sure that uh, we've got our orbit done properly in order to reach back, uh, reach Cape Canaveral again. Otherwise, we'll end up in Miami or something or Georgia. So, yeah, it's just to simplify the math for me. In this case, we should be very well in line with Florida. It's a little bit cloudy to be able to tell. Uh, there we go. You can see Cape Canaveral right there and our ground track right over it. So, yeah, keeping it to a day does make it a lot simpler. Okay, we've got a sunrise. We're still falling short, which is 
annoying, but we tend to hang out at this altitude for a little while. You can see our vertical speed is not that high, so hopefully we'll catch up on it. And it is it has pitched down to 37 degrees. We are currently over Mexico. Well, I feel like I'll need to make some adjustments to this re-entry script because this is a fairly light shuttle right now and still we are falling short so a heavier shuttle will probably have more trouble. More testing will be necessary. Well, unfortunately we're a long way off from nominal here now so my attempt to figure it out through testing has not been sufficient. We're, we still haven't hit the coast of Florida and we're gonna start pitching down necessarily because we've got way... Um, yeah, we're just gonna start pitching down at 45 kilometers. Uh, you can see it actually turning right now in order to change its heading towards the KSC. That's normal. Mm, it rolling off to the side isn't normal. I mean, I think it should be the other side, not this side. Hold on. Let me... Oh, I didn't want to press T there. Uh, okay. I wanted to... It's probably a bad idea for me to take control right now, to be honest. This is a transition zone. Uh, let me see if I can do this without causing too much pain and suffering. It's tough to handle once it's outside of its comfort zone. I'm gonna dump fuel so that we're lighter. Now, of course, the shuttle would dump fuel anyway. That's just so it doesn't land with a whole load of toxic fuels. Incidentally, the thrust is not gonna help us at all. Because it's, you can see the current acceleration down there. It's not exactly going to push us to any particular location. So it doesn't look like I'm going to actually fulfill the one special part of this mission that it's the first shuttle mission to land back at its, or the first any space mission maybe, to land back at its launch site. Uh, first one to land at Cape Canaveral instead of Edwards Air Force Base. But that's alright, I fulfilled what I wanted to fulfill, which was getting those satellites there so that we can recover them. Incidentally, I did run through this mission and land at Cape Canaveral before recording this video, but apparently things that I did this time changed stuff. It's very sensitive. Uh, for those who have flown shuttles in stock Kerbal Space Program, that's a lot easier, I have to say, having done so myself as well. I'll reserve a little bit, but I'm going to turn RCS off. Um, yeah. With Earth being 10 times the diameter, that's 100 times the surface area. So it's quite a bit more difficult, and the sheer speed that you're coming in at doesn't help. Manually, uh, it might be easier for me to figure it out, though I tend to overcompensate a bit. Uh, the thing is, it's not very smooth when I'm trying to bring it down manually without KOS. That ground doesn't look the flattest, to be honest. And... Oh, misjudged a little bit. Okay, slow down. Well, we didn't stop where I wanted to, but at least we got them down safely. So, next time I'll try to get it back to the right landing location. But for now, we'll have to sell for this. The satellites are up. It'll take me some time to figure out exactly how to retrieve them. It'll probably involve the claw somehow, but uh, yep, need to determine that method. But there we go, uh, a rendition of STS-41B. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.